Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, fashion and more. So th this is the title. This is the title of the of the panel. So we're supposed to give you insights of on the digital impact uh, of the Web3 on the fashion industry. So we're going to try to do that. First, who's, who's working in fashion here? OK. In fashion, in luxury, maybe? OK. I, I see people, you know, some people working in luxury, not in fashion. Huh? It's very different. Uh, do we have uh, people working for brands? that are not neither fashion nor luxury. OK. People working in Web3. <laughs> now this is a conference. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is uh, Pierre-Nicolas Hurstel. I am a CEO and co-founder at Ariane. We are a Web3 solution platform for brands created in 2017 at a time where NFTs and Web3 were not words used in the common language. So we've, we came a long way. And I'm really happy to be today with an amazing panel to try to unfold some of the questions, at least we have, on the impact Web3 is going to have on the fashion industry. So I'm here with uh, Ashumi from MAD, Adriana from The Fabricant, Olivier from Exclusible, and Diego, who's an independent consultant who's been working a lot with Adidas. And I'll, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in just a few seconds. But first, I'd like to share with you the questions we would like to solve today. Uh, we drafted six questions. Why fashion and luxury? that are generally so slow and traditional, seems to want or try or be ahead of the curve in the Web3 space. Why, why do we hear so much about fashion and luxury trying to embrace this space? Are they going at the good pace? Uh, is it working? I'm going to try to, to answer this question. What are the real use cases of digital fashion? I mean, are we going to be at home, naked, with digital fashion on us, posting on Instagram? Are we going to dress our avatars? Is it something different, something better? And I think we have the good people here to show us how better that can be. Um, what will fashion look like in the metaverse? Digital goods, digital spaces, retail, what is it going to look like? Um, how is, the new, how th is this new channel is going to play out? How is it going to play out with existing channel, channels, with e-commerce, with physical retail, with wholesale? What is going to be the integration? What can we learn from the first initiatives and one of the largest initiatives uh, uh, that we'll discuss today? What, what can we learn? What, what worked, what didn't work from what major brands did in the space? And finally, how can we differentiate a PR activation from a significant brand strategy in Web3? So we're going to try to cover these questions, for, but first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, this amazing panel. Um, Olivier, do you want to try? Do you want to go first, sure. and then we go all the way? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. So I'm Olivier Moinjon. I'm the co-founder and chief commercial officer of Exclusible. Uh, in a few words, Exclusible is a marketplace for luxury brands to sell their NFTs. But we are also becoming a Web3 brand. We've done a few jobs under our own name, Exclusible, and we have a growing community of uh, enthusiasts and uh, collectors. But we're also now a Metaverse partner. We own uh, very large lands in Sandbox, where we have built and sold luxury villas, luxury islands. Um, we also participated in Decentraland Fashion Week. Uh, we also uh, own land in a NFT worlds, and we're also working with Paychall. So we are a metaverse slash NFT um, experts. Thank you, Olivier. Adriana? Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Adriana. I'm one of the co-founders of The Fabricant, and The Fabricant is a digital-only fashion house, which we started in 2018, when nobody talked about the NFTs quite yet, and since then we have been in this mission to build a digital-only fashion industry. And we believe, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, that uh, in the future, we're all going to have a larger digital wardrobe than the physical one, as we're going to be curating our identities in the metaverse. 
And we are doing it right now, creating the largest wardrobe of the metaverse with uh, the Fabricant Studio, which we launched uh, last year. And it's a platform where anybody can co-create digital fashion and start actually creating a trade. So we'll, we'll be a platform of launching digital-only fashion labels where anybody can uh, be part of. And then working with Exclusible to put it in their shops, but actually creating a truly decentralized ecosystem where, again, everybody can participate. Thank you, Adriana. Diego? Yeah, I mean, the last eight years, I've, I've worked with brands, consulting brands uh, on the world on world, right, the Web2 world. Um, the last four years, I spent at Adidas. I was consulting Adidas in, in headquarter in Germany. Um, I was part of the founding team of, uh, or, or the team behind, basically, the core team behind uh, Into the Metaverse that brought Adidas into the Metaverse. That was the first, the, the last thing I've done um, for the brand. And then in December last year, I left the company basically to, to do three different things. So my personal vision and mission within the space is to bring NFTs and blockchain technology mainstream. And uh, the three things I do to help me to get there is one, I consult different brands, uh, you know, from fashion and, and other industries as well on how to enter the metaverse and the NFT space. Um, the second one is I work with a lot of NFT native projects, um, you know, consulting them more on the marketing side, but also um, getting them on how to go to market and different strategies. Um, and the third thing is really focused on education. So that being by being speaker or on demand uh, content or um, now we are basically, shout out to, to me at AMS is an event we're gonna be throwing in June, uh, which is the first uh, Metaverse Festival in Europe, uh, which is gonna be there. We also doing NFT Latin, is the first NFT, NFT um, event in Latin America. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of like how I spend my time within these three pillars and sort of like try to, to get myself to, to accelerate the, yeah, the, the growth of the space in the sense. Thank you, Diego. Asumi? Hi everyone, um, I'm Ashmi and I'm the founder and CEO of Mad Global. Uh, we have two parts to our business. We have been in, uh, well, Mad Productions has been a production services company working with brands in the Web2 space, uh, creating and producing omni-channel content for films, digital uh, and films, films, digital and stills for fashion and luxury cl clients. And in the Web3 space, we have uh, Mad XR for which we've been bringing uh, brands into the space, but also working with agencies and marketplaces. And we do everything end to end from creation, ideation, strategy, right through to the production and the delivery across platform for um, mostly fashion and luxury clients. Our most recent project was with Bulgari, where we worked with a traditional uh, illustrator and we curated a collection of his work where we, um, and then we did an NFT drop uh, linked to physical pieces of his work as well. And yeah, coming up, we're working with a lot of other brands uh, to drop uh, projects within the metaverse umbrella. So 3D, AR, we work a lot with immersive technology as well, augmented reality, virtual reality, and NFTs, of course. Thank you very much. So my first question is gonna be for you, Diego, and I'm sure that's the question everyone here uh, would like to ask you. When the hell are we gonna receive this yellow track shoot? No, I'm kidding. Um, what, what, can you unfold, can you, unfold uh, you know, for us this Adidas operation, like transparently? Basically, what did you learn? What worked? What didn't work? You know, when we look, when we look at this, it's like massive amount of sales, 30,000 NFTs, huge community built up from a brand that was not in the space. It looks like so wonderful. Can you tell us more about what worked, what didn't work, and what should we learn? collectively brands and web three professionals from that sure yeah i think there's three there's you know within adidas what happened to us but what i'm seeing as well a lot within the space in general when i'm working with brands especially brands that big um is that you always have like these three blockers right the first one uh, we faced and i all talk about adidas but also mirroring with other brands i'm working with because it's sort of like a pattern i identified um, the first thing is always sustainability, right? That, that is something huge for Adidas when, when it comes to like the values of the company and where the company's headed. Um, but a lot of brands I'm working with, the first question I get, especially for people that are not necessarily into the technology or understand or have a very high level understanding of it, is, is sustainability. So it's always connected to what the mainstream media is pushing out, which is obviously that very strong, clear narrative that NFT you mint kills a polar bear. 
you know, which is not necessarily the truth, but you know, uh, that's kind of like how those conversations usually start. So we, we had to unlock a lot of that, uh, especially because the way the, brands op the brand operates, uh, but that has been a conversation that I've been facing throughout every single brand I engage, I engage with. Um, the second one is a lot about, um, you know, and that's where we spend a lot of time. If you think it took us about seven months to, to build all of it, um, about five months we spent talking to treasury, to corporate, to legal, to all that part of the business, which, you know, is, it's really complicated to get someone from marketing or from social ready to understand what this is all about. But then when you get that layer of like safety and, and, the, and the problems of bringing cryptocurrency into a balance sheet of a public traded company, that's where it gets really complicated. Uh, you know, so we, we obviously try to look into solutions. We know there's some SaaS options out there. Uh, but for us, what worked the best and, and what works a lot when I work with different brands is basically using either a middleman, which holds the IP or holds the right of the franchise, uh, and then converts it to, into fiat and then bring it back to the, to the company, or literally creating like a separate entity that holds that um, value and then can use that value to further develop the project. We did the first uh, with Adidas, but there's companies and brands I'm working with that we do, we do either one or other. Um, and then the third aspect within this pillar is literally uh, education, right? So we onboarded over, and when I say we, we're, we're a team of about probably five to seven people. We onboarded over 200 people within the organization, which a lot of times was one by one, and other times was we created different channels and you know like resources where people could go and learn about. Um, and that was the big, the big lift, right? So really trying to get people to understand one, what we are doing, two, why it matters, three, what is the potential impact behind it, um, and sort of like shifting the mindset as well of what there is a lot of this, this, this conversation around, especially you know when you look from outside on, it's all about apes, it's all about like PFPs, and trying to get people to think that the technology actually enables you to do much more things than that. And it's just not limited to it. And it could be seen as a hype, obviously, because the amount of money that's being thrown left and right, and that's what does the headlines. Uh, you know, that, that aspect of education was where we spent a lot of time as well. The good thing was that we haven't got a lot of like pushback from, from people, no, you shouldn't be doing it, or this is bad. It was more people, they were intrigued about it and tried to learn, and that slowed down the process because you get more people involved. But I think that throughout the execution, people start getting a little bit more, you know. Um, from another big learn was, and, and that's also something that I'm always hammering when I'm talking to brands, is a lot of people or a lot of brands are focused on the, on the revenue. So when you say, you know, the, the millions that were, were, were headlines, I think we made 26 mil in 24 hours at pre-sale or at first at, at primary. Uh, and everybody was like, yeah, that's a lot of money for, for, for people from outside of the brand space. But for a company that does a 24 billion revenue a year, it's not necessarily a lot. Right, so the money wasn't really a big impact. Uh, what we tried to steer the conversation towards was more, we got 30,000 NFTs, and back there I think there was about 20,000 20, holders, more or less. That's where it gets exciting, because then you're looking to individual wallets, which you know, we know that none of them are individual wallets or individual individuals, but there is a big community being built around that brand that was represented by that number. So shifting the, the main slides or, you know, the SOT decks from we made shit tons of money to actually a lot of people actually care and want to be part of this thing, it's what became really exciting, you know. So really shifting the narrative from, yes, you can have a new revenue stream and you can grow the company, to more towards like, this is a place where you can now get connected with consumers in a different level, that now you can interact with consumers in a manner that wasn't possible before because the technology was not in place. And now you can expand your reach and grow your brand when it comes to long-term connection with consumers rather than thinking just about how much money you just made. Yeah, bouncing back on this uh, connection with customers, uh, the, the choice you made to you know, whitelist holders of big collections first and made their life super easy to jump in the process. Um, what was the reaction of your community, people who could not access to the drop because they don't have a board able? Did they care? Did you see, did you have to manage that? Or was it super smooth because you completely attracted like an adjacent community? How did you manage that? 
I mean, one of the the main ideas is authenticity, right? That's the way we we wanted to go in. And if you look at why Ethereum, for example, which was one of the questions related to sustainability, was about authenticity. It's coming into the space and being where the liquidity is, being where uh, you know people are more comfortable uh, with trading right now. Uh, so authenticity was a key aspect, and that's why we went also with the bigger communities out there, right? Um, I think that. If we would try to do what we did now, it would be impossible. Looking at the size of Yuga Labs and all ever, and everything, uh, you know, would have been better with G Money because obviously now he would have finally the so dreamed IP ownership that he was always fighting for, and now he does have it. Um, but you know, I think in that aspect, we we went with thirty thousand, which is a large number. Uh, the distribution we wanted to do was within those communities that were quite large as well. Uh, we wanted to be authentic, but also reward. Uh, the ones that have been in the space for longer, but we did manage to sort of like, um, you know, get people that just have been to a podcast that G-Money has done and claim a pull up, and they were able to do it too. So it's absolutely for free. We've thrown that, uh, you know, manifesto at the beginning that basically uh, we got to think two and a half thousand people that were basically did the pull up against that manifesto as well. So there was a lot of like free or almost very low price entry to people that wanted to be part of it. Uh, and then afterwards, there was also obviously the, the public mint, you know, which you can't say it's perfect because no public mint is perfect when there is demand because there's always gas wars and all of it. But we try to do our best to be as inclusive as possible. You know, it's, it's just difficult. You need to, you know, and that's, that's something I talk with a lot of brands as well, is how do you, how do you measure uh, demand, not necessarily by creating FOMO or scarcity because that's insane and and it's a mindset that we definitely should be looking to change. But how can you demand, how can you create demand in a positive manner and also make sure that it's healthy and sustainable to one, attract enough people, but then two, uh, you know, give value so people who are interested in being part of the ecosystem. So we, we try to do that, you know, and, and it's definitely not perfect, but I think looking from outside, and that's what I try to do a lot, especially now, because uh, I'm not necessarily part of the, 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 that work stream anymore, but looking from outside, I think it paved the way for a lot of brands on like thinking different, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Adriana, um, the Adidas drop was a lot about you get a token and then you're going to get four physical goods, you know, the famous yellow track shirt and the beanie and everything. So, you know, your play is 100% digital. What you said earlier, we're going to have a digital wardrobe. So how is that going to play out? How, we, how are we going to use this wardrobe? Is it like for every day? Is it for us as ourselves, just for our avatars? Can you, can you walk us through the use cases and how you see in five years, 10 years, two years, I don't know, this digital wardrobe? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we do only digital, never physical. And, and I can't even put a, a merch of the fabric and my team doesn't allow. <laughs> I keep asking, give me a t-shirt with the fabric. Oh, no. literally, only you're not digital, allowed to have merch. Oh. <laughs> I said that I'll do it anyway, uh, but I'm a bit naughty. But like, we, we really believe in the, in the use case for digital only because uh, we are building a business for years ahead. And since 2018, we have been talking about it. And in five years, we truly believe that our digital wardrobe is going to be as valid as our physical one. We're building for a future where we're going to have a very small physical wardrobe because our clothes are going to be augmented on our bodies. And we're going to truly be changing clothes every time. And uh, not as physical with physical limitations, but just going crazy and really being able to explore our identities in a much more free way. That is in five years, ten years, God knows. Um, how, how is how that going to work? We'll does, all have glasses and see um, augmented version I of think, our work. I think our probably the, the first stage is going to be glasses and, uh, and the final stage is going to be beamed. Um, you know, I was in the mobile business when Wi-Fi didn't exist and people thought Wi-Fi was crazy. It was never going to take off. Here we are. We are in a world completely connected. So thinking about beaming and the holographic image is absolutely viable. However, there, is a, there are a few steps for technology to get there. So going back where we are right now, there are already super, I think, brilliant use cases and a few of are around here, the, the panel. And, uh, and again, fashion is all about identity. And identity is all about human connection and communities. And I think answering your question, why fashion is maybe ahead of the time versus other industries, is because when we're talking about NFTs, and especially the PFPs, it's not a JPEG, it's a club is my identity. 
you know, nobody sells an ape these days because it's so valuable. It tells so much about who you are, owning an ape, owning a world of women or, or a punk. That is what fashion is about. We wear differently. We have different possessions to express who we are. So just having your digital wardrobe already and show to people this my curation already says something about yourself. But then the next is how, how do you wear it in the metaverse? Is the metaverse really something exciting? And there are early adopters. There are a few, uh, you know, when you talk to the central and sandbox, a few thousand people playing around. Uh, it's going to get more, right? And the experience is going to get better. And two years ago, the experience in the central end was terrible. Right now, it's acceptable. Is it like the best? No, but the team is working really hard and fidelity is going to increase and the ease of use is going to increase and this is going to be the next social communities, right? Uh, I think when we think about Web3, you need to be thinking about, remember that time where Web was only about sending emails? Then remember that time when Web was only about pictures? Now remember the time we are right now where Web is videos, right? Now the next Web is going to be immersive and we're not going to be talking about this anymore. And that is very, very close. Not for nothing, Instagram is starting to uh, you know, integrate NFTs because the technology that will be enabled by all these platforms is going to be immersive. It's going to be gaming technology, high fidelity, real time. At that moment, you're meeting your communities in an immersive case. At that moment, you're changing your gender into not female, male, but alien or octopus. And um, you're going to be... Yeah, having crazy clothes and you're going to ha be having your own wardrobe. And I think what we are super excited about is that it's going to revolutionize the entire fashion industry. And your wardrobe, guess what? You can also create yourself and you can become a designer and you can set up your label and you can create your micro community. And that's what we are about. We are here to launch new labels. We are here to challenge the physical world to create a new industry that is more sustainable, that is much more creative, and is that centralized where everybody can profit, where there is no sweatshop anymore, because a kid that is in a sweatshop can become a designer. Yeah, I mean, super inspiring. Get a bit passionate about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! I mean, look, I think I'm going to keep a question for sustainability at the end, you know, servers and 30,000 NFTs on Ethereum at the end, if we have time. But your fashion house, which means your brand, do you work with brands? And if you do, in which capacity? How do you help them? What's the advice you have for them when they want to play that game? No, very good question. Um, we call ourselves the Digital Fashion House 3.0. At one stage uh, in our journey, we could have decided to hire designers and create the wardrobe of the metaverse ourselves. But we said that doesn't make any sense because the power of Web3 is to be decentralized, is to be able to co-create, so let's go that route. So anybody here can be a designer in our fashion house. That's our concept. And we work with brands as well because we think it's fundamental to get them to onboard all of us because they have the power to bring people into the narrative, right? They have power of their friendship. But uh, we are we're quite, yeah, quite hard-nosed in choosing who we want to partner with because we want brands that really embrace the Web3 ethos, especially in the stage that we are. And uh, yeah, some brands find it really hard that uh, they will need to split the royalties with uh, the creators that are in the platform equally. You know, it's not because you're a brand that you're better than a creator that is providing the patterns and materials or somebody that's coming and uh, actually customize your item. Uh, so I think that, that is the nice thing. When we get into the royalties, we actually realize whether the brand is ready for us or not. And, uh, but lucky enough, there are a lot of uh, good conversations. There, there is a lot of mindset shifting that is happening in this space. And uh, I really believe that, uh, yeah, that's the new way to go. And it's paying back your friendship, right? We're not, I think the new generation, the web-free generation, the people that are here, we don't want to be consumers anymore. We realize that our power is to demand that we are seen as valuable creators, right? That the pictures we take in Instagram means that we are photographers and we should be rewarded for that. And I think that kind of mindset shift, which uh, post-consumerism is the new uh, one that the brands in all industries will need to adopt and revise the business models towards it. Now we just have to wait for decentralized Instagram and everything will be fine. Uh, Olivier, Olivier uh, so 
what what is the expression for brands in the metaverse? I mean, you have you 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 mentioned what you do at Exclusible. There's the real estate part. There's what you build on the real estate, and then there's the goods and probably even the experiences. So. There's a new world that could, you know, play with the same code. How do you approach that, and how do you see brand expressing themselves in the metaverse, and how do you help them do that? Yeah, sure. So I always like to use the filter that everything that happens in the real life, in the real world, it's going to be exactly the same logic, the same mechanism in the metaverse so or better in digital. Push to the limits of creativity. But yeah, it's very interesting because we started building Exclusible back in May, like in the spring of 2021, when we started putting the idea together with the team and we started pitching brands at the time. Um, and then Facebook decided to change their name and somehow the conversation changed. And after that, all of a sudden, the metaverse became you know, somehow of a priority for a lot of brands. So it's very interesting because I've been in luxury for 18 years. Okay, I worked at Cartier, Goyard, uh, then Bastide, a French beauty brand. So I was in the space when e-commerce came about, like you know, in the early 2000s. Luxury brands have always been late into the game. They are not pioneers. They are slow movers. You know, they are adopters. Um, then the second-hand economy came, like the resale economy came in the 2010s. Uh, same thing, the brands completely bypassed that, uh, that new business. Um, and then the pandemic came, and I think in 12 months, there was the equivalent of technological adoption of five years. Everybody realized that without digital, then potentially just relaying on stores, you can't survive. You know, you have to have like a true comprehensive digital strategy. And so what's very interesting right now is that brands want to learn about Web3. They want to have this discussion about the metaverse, NFTs. For us, the way we see it, it's two sides of the same coin. You know, NFTs are like the product, it's the what. The metaverse, it becomes the how and where. So it's the experiential side of a brand, it's the boutique, it's the store, you know, and they go hand in hand. And so the brands understand that there is a gigantic shift in generational behavior, okay, and that Gen Alpha, Gen Z is completely native for them. Yes, they are already spending, you know, some type of money on Roblox. They are already changing outfits every day on these platforms. They already are, they are completely digital. They go from like a phone screen to an interaction with their friends in the real world back into digital. It's very easy for them, it's completely native. So if you tell your, you ask your kids, you know, like, would you spend money for this digital item or this physical item? For them, it's the same thing. It's how cool it makes them look, how it makes them feel and there's absolutely zero differentiation between digital and physical. So right now we're at this super interesting moment where the chakras have not been opened yet, like it has not clicked in the mind of brands, but it will, and they are getting there day by day, they are learning and educating themselves. Um, and I cannot wait for the moment when it does click and the amount of creativity that will come from brands for us, it's luxury brands that we're you know, focusing on, but all brands, it's going to be incredible. Because luxury, it's about creating desirability. Uh, it's an inspiration. And um, they sell the experience. You know, they sell you a dream. And so once that dream becomes translated into a world that has zero limits, the time doesn't apply, the laws of physics do not apply, and you have this, that hyper-connectivity, then it's going to be absolutely incredible. And so right now, it's like baby steps. You know, you know that very well. You know? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I mean, the, when you mix the creativity, the concepts of scarcity and experience, and um, one of the brands we work with, they talk about digital craftsmanship, because luxury is all about craftsmanship. So when they're going to discover how creative 
uh, digital artisans can be, and all of that is going to kick in. That's going to be really uh, awesome. Uh, and uh, Ashumi, um, so when we when we see all these all the brands trying to do things, and the one we work, you work with, and we all work with. How can you help us make the difference between, um, you know, PR activations and I would not say cash grabs, but people who want to just grab the light at some point and significant strategies? What is a significant brand strategy in Web3 today? Because when you look at how the pure Web3 community is looking at brands, it's like a lot of pushback. Often very few brands are in the position of Adidas, you know, being positively welcomed. So. What's the good, significant, significant strategy uh, to, to the contrary of the PR coup? So I think that the brands that have not done it very well have kind of used this very unoriginally, a copy-pasted sort of creative. You know, they've looked to see what other people are doing and literally copy-pasted that exact same strategy and concept and even design in some cases and launched a project. Um, and with that, I think, you know, I think the Web3 communities are very astute into knowing what is right and authentic and what is not. Um, so obviously there's, there's a lot of pushback because obviously the community is so strong in the space. I think brands like Gucci, for example, are doing a fantastic job because they're doing it authentically, but they're also doing it with a really strong storytelling aspect to you know, everything that they're doing in the space. And as storytelling, essentially for brands, especially of course luxury brands, is such an important and powerful tool to talk about who you are and how you bring out the emotion. Because at the end of the day, it's not only really about the product, it's also about how you make people feel and how you kind of you know, bring them into your world and into your universe. So I think you have to kind of touch upon a lot of different points before you actually just throw them off the deep end and try to sell them into buying your project. Um, so, I'd like to come back to the sustainability question. Okay, so we're not gonna we're gonna have less clothes. We're gonna have more digital stuff, and all of that run on Ethereum. And you know, V2 is coming maybe one day. So, you know, how how do you deal? With it? Because that's the first point you mentioned, sustainability. And I don't think this project you ran was sustainable. So how did you do that? How did you manage that? And, and then question for Adriana, you know, is it more sustainable to have nodes replicating, uh, you know, than, you know, organic cotton on a t-shirt? <laughs> it's difficult. You did, you did it. Uh, you, well, you, it's my you, fault. You I know. It's my fault. First, huh? I pointed as a problem, but I wasn't here to, to give the solution, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay, so it's, pass to Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's difficult. I mean, um, the way I'm always trying to to balance out that conversation is is always questioning from the why the brand is interested in coming to the space. So you know, like if you want to do that in a in the authentic manner to speak with a specific audience that you know is a lot of times interested in either liquidity or are very like you know. If you're a maxi, if you will, because they believe that that's the only way of doing things, then probably you need to go through that hurdle, right? And there is a lot of solutions of uh, one, monitoring on-chain activity, and two, mitigating um, carbon emissions through carbon offset, right? There's protocols doing it. There's companies doing it. Uh, Nori is a good example that I know. I know the team from. So you compensated everything. You compensate basically. Is it what you did with Adidas? Is it what they did? Um, not not necessarily, okay. but. It's it's what I'm trying to say. Like okay. you know, there is an issue, and 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 the way I try to look into solving that issue with other brands as well, not necessarily okay. what we've done with Adidas. Um, it's by looking into compensation, right? So you have one that op that option of measuring that chain activity. If you definitely want to go on Ethereum, for example, that's the the one that's the hottest when it comes to sustainability. And two is compensating that by offsetting, uh, you know, that carbon emission through different manners. Uh, that's that's kind of like one of one of the solutions I look at. The other one is just going to other protocols. There's plenty of them, uh, you know, that are uh, on proof of uh, wor proof of stake rather than proof of work, which then you know takes a good amount of that conversation and obviously that carbon emission within uh, within the activity you're setting. So I always try to approach the conversation from that angle. Um, it's it's highly complex because you know. The, the mainstream media has been very vocal and very strong on their agenda of pushing back. 
So majority of the people that are not necessarily into the space or don't understand a lot about the technology come with that angle already and it's becoming really technical or really difficult to sort of like go around it. So those are the two ways I usually yeah. try to approach. Uh, you know, either you compensate or you use another uh, network that, you know, it's yeah. it's a greener network, quote unquote, because I don't really like that term, but it's a way of sort of like yeah. go go about it. And you pray for Ethereum V2 to, to come sooner than this. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ad Adriana is uh, an avatar dressed up in digital fashion, uh, which is in the form of an NFT, on servers replicating everywhere, on a public blockchain better than uh, a local suit t-shirt of Good organic question. cotton? Good question. I think the first thing that, uh, I don't know if everybody realized, but fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world. I don't know about that one. I know because Vanessa I researched Friedman, about it. <laughs> Vanessa Friedman in the New York Times no, unfolded I know, this. I know because this. I actually, um, we had that question. And he said, yeah, I can say that, but let's, let's actually go to the people that study it. So we partnered with uh, Imperial College in London to actually run a research about physical versus digital. And, and again, the quote was second most polluting industry. And the reason is because uh, fashion has, is polluting from three different angles. One is the CO2 emissions, the other is uh, toxicity, and the third is the human capital. And uh, I think when you take all of these into account, you could say that, uh, and, and only, actually we only took the CO2 into account, the digital only model was 99% more sustainable than the physical one. And we did it without the blockchain component, which of course makes it a, a, bit, a bit different, depending on which chain you decide to work with. So when we had to build our product, we decided to go to the most sustainable chain that was available, and we built our product on Flow. And Flow is proof of stake, which actually means that the CO2 emission is still considerably lower than the physical equivalent. Next to that, what our proposition is all about is the human side, which again, building a decentralized model means that we can actually decentralize wealth and redistribute it. And I think that case is equally super important and not to be forgotten. So back to your point here, yeah, there are more sustainable solutions. Look at what the physical industry is and the footprint, which is quite high. And, and you know, I would suggest that everybody to take a look. If you're interested in this piece, uh, we publish it as open source in our website under the tab sustainability, the, the work we did with the Imperial College. And if you have more to add, yeah, let's keep adding, let's keep digging and researching and challenging ourselves to make it more sustainable as we go. Did, did you add uh, to the study the, the impact, impact of immersive metaverses and like all the we, calculations? Yeah, we added, we exactly, we added uh, uh, not only the creation, but actually the use as well, and we added uh, online hours. But again, let's not be uh, holier than the Pope and not forget that the entire supply chain of fashion uses a lot of computing power as well. Things are designed online, the whole logistics built on computers. So people tend to be forget that actually we are living in a highly connected world that computer, um, uh, computer let's say, uh, waste mm. is, is actually available everywhere these days, right? Thank you. Um, okay, I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. So I just have one question for the four of you, the same question, you just answer quickly. So what's next? What are we going to see at the end of this year and beginning of 23? Brands activations that you think are going to really, uh, uh, you know, stand out? So, so on my side, something that I think is really amazing right now is the creation of Web3 brands based on IP and based on community. And so the Web3 brand has clients who buy repeatedly. The Web3 brand has fans and followers. They have an IP that's known, that's recognizable, but they don't have a product. And I think that's uh, absolutely fascinating. And when we see the valuation, uh, you know, of the acquisition of, uh, by Yuga Labs, when you see uh, the floor price on Azuki, which is like, you know, three months, four months old, something like that. Um, and the activation that they do in the community and the physical part, the physical expression of those IPs, I think it's really amazing. It's a momentous moment in, um, in, in modern branding where basically it's beyond, you know, we went from the four Ps to the four Cs. And now it's like a new generation, a new shape of brand that's emerging from Web3. And it's only the beginning. So I think we will see more and more consolidation, first of all. And then brands doing collaboration with 
legacy Web2 brands. Thank you. Adriana? Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I think uh, like one of the things I'm super excited about is the PFP projects and how, you know, indeed the like, native brands were initiated and have so much love. And uh, I'll give a scoop because we are about to launch our uh, collaboration with World of Women. And we actually create the entire collection of World of Women in 3D. And uh, the community we receive as airdropped the 3D dresses. And then they're invited to co-create their own unique NFT with us. And I think you're gonna, we're going to see like the, these uh, PFP projects taking a whole new life online and offline, right? Becoming true experience uh, uh, and communities where there is a lot of value and products being made. And I think the other side is uh, the power of micro communities and micro labels and micro enterprises. And I think only in, f in fashion, there'll be thousands. And, I, and I'm, I'm super excited about it, of seeing all these new labels coming and uh, offering, or people offering the services, right? I think we're going to see new professions. We're going to see event organizers for the central end events. <laughs> we're going to see digital tailors. We actually now have digital tailors. We create high quality uh, fashion items, and we need digital tailors to translate them into sandbox voxel uh, formats. And it's super cool because actually it's a new, completely new profession. I'm super excited about it. Yeah. Cool. Can't wait for the World of Women dress. Yeah, I think four things that really stand out to me. I think the first one is going to be a real world impact. I think that right now the thing the space lacks the most is um, you know, using the technology and displaying the users of, of technology in a way that we can actually create positive impact in the world at being by several different manners. I think there's a lot of sleeping giants that are starting to do that. Um, and I think as soon as people realize that there are much more to it than, you know, the classic PFP, PFPs right now is when we start to look into mainstream adoption rather than, you know, this questioning or people that are sitting on the side just because they're like, I don't understand and it's too complex to get in. But if you can protect and save or, uh, you know, create new war, uh, social impact projects through this technology, I think it's going to be incredible. Uh, I think what, just happening, what is just happening in Europe right now uh, is a good example of, you know, how crypto can leverage uh, uh, someone or, 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 or any cause or anything that's happening in the world. So the donations to Ukraine, for example, through cryptocurrency has been incredible usage of this technology, which I feel that some people that weren't ready for it are like, oh, wow, yeah, the banks are closed. They are in a, you know, in a, someone put them in a really bad situation and now the whole world can help them through this, through this decentralized option. So I think we're going to start seeing more and more of it. Um, you know, I think that's one. Uh, two, I think, especially with brands, I think co-ownership is going to start becoming a bigger thing. I'm always pushing that agenda everywhere I'm going. And I love when you're talking about royalties, for example. Uh, and, you know, if, if that doesn't resonate, I'm not working with that brand. But co-ownership rather than just, you know, supporting the artists or supporting uh, who is doing the work, but actually getting the IP thrown to a DAO, for example, and then getting the community to co-create how the future could look like with that brand, I think that's going to be huge. And I think there is a lot of opportunities within it. Uh, the third one I would see, the third pillar is DAOs, obviously, you know, just really impacting, and for who doesn't know, is decentralized autonomous organizations. So really impacting the ones, uh, the way that humans organize and, and communicate and vote and, and, and write and take decisions together. I think that's going to be a huge change uh, on, on the way society operates more than ever now because we're going to be in this, this you know, all connected internet level that we weren't before or as much as we are now basically, basically because we spent two years locked down throughout the entire world. So I think we are closer than ever now and that technology now enables us to, you know, create whatever we want uh, and that pays back to, to the, the real world impact. I think it's going to be the next big thing. And then play to earn. I think, you know, like, I know that's not necessarily connected to fashion, but a lot of it can be when we're talking about skins specifically, right? Like our, uh, you know, kids or, or the, the generation before us are used to that. They're native to that already. So bringing that layer into, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies or, or bringing that layer on chain where people can trade within, within each other, or have a marketplace, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be huge. So I think those, those four things is where I'm very bullish at. Uh, you know, if any project tackles or taps into that, um, I'm listening. And that's always what I'm trying to push into the brands and projects I'm working with because I think that's, that's where we're going to be. We're going to be talking a lot the next like six to 12 months. Yeah, just bouncing back on that, on April 15th, there's going to be an NFT drop to support uh, Ukraine on uh, Together Ukraine. It's a group of uh, uh, 
hundreds of uh, French entrepreneurs who gathered to really truly organize logistical, logistical support. And there's going to be an NFT drop on the 15th, so you can look at that on Twitter and the hashtag uh, TogetherUkraine, who's an amazing artist that have contributed their work and everything goes to Ukraine with, with a very strong, um, actually, logistic organization behind, so it's, it's really serious. Take a look at it. Um, Ashima? Um, so actually, the most the two most important things that I'm quite um, excited about is uh, immersive experiences. I think there's definitely a lot of space to layer in the different technologies, especially augmented reality, into real-world experiences as well. Um, and then linking in, of course, you know, NFTs um, into that, as well as the convergence of the physical and digital spaces. So, you know, we've already seen quite a lot of activations happen in retail, for example. Selfridges did one recently for Paco Rabanne. Bringing in the, 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 the technology layer into physical retail spaces is something that's going to be quite big as well, I think, um, coming up. And then the second thing I would say would, is cross-collaboration across industry. So whether it's across fashion and music or fashion and the arts, um, I think we're going to see a lot of that happening as well, you know, um, across industry and, across, and how those use cases are applied uh, with different technologies across many different verticals. Thank you very much. Um, so if you want to continue the conversation uh, on fashion and omnichannel, uh, immersive and digital and physical space, uh, I'm doing a keynote tomorrow at 11.50 on this topic, omnichannel for brands in the Web3 space. So I'll be happy to have you and continue the, the conversation. Thank you very much to all of you. Do we have a couple of questions? Do we have time to have like one or two questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, main stage. Uh, question, yes. Can you, can I grab one? Oh. They don't stop us, so we continue. Thank you so much, this is really exciting. Um, one of the big parts of creativity is uh, responding to limitations, uh, whether it's materials or craftsmanship or other things like that, that kind of make a framework for a creativity to take place. I'm wondering what you think the exciting new limitations of this landscape are going to be. Yeah, that's for you. The, the, the limitations? You mean the limitations? What are the exciting new limitations of this uh, new l landscape for creating digital you know, fashion that people will have to be challenged by and work oh, towards? Yeah. Oh, you need to come to our atelier and <laughs> you're gonna see a lot of designers frustrated. <laughs> Because you think that because in the computer is very easy, but actually there is there is a lot of technique. It's true craftsmanship, and um, and I think one of the the main frustrations is still is a real life, a real time simulation of uh, of fabrics. Is still a hard one to crack. Just the high fidelity, uh, like we we. Yeah, we really produce very, very high fidelity, and to have it represented in different spaces in real time is still a challenge. Um, I think sometimes it's just like even. Um, trying to get something crazy out there and uh, having people connect it because there is a level of uh, where we are that it almost needs to be um, almost like similar enough to reality because otherwise it's too crazy for people to understand, right? And, and I think a lot of the creators are already in the crazy and you need to take one step back so that we normal people like me can understand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there is a lot of technique. I would say technique is probably still the, the hardest one. Computer technique and uh, and getting the simulations in the right way. It's, it's a lot of technique. Thank you. One last? Sorry. Yes? Okay. Oh. I, oh. oh, yeah, you want to answer too? No, no. I'm no. Oh. Else. Okay. <laughs> Let's just take another question. Oh, um, I have a question. What advice would you give to a small fashion brand, small medium fashion brand, not Adidas of course, but what advice would you give for someone that wants to go into the NFT world? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. Uh, actually, you know, I wanted to g give a shout out to someone in the room, Amedeo, right there, <laughs> because it's linked to your question. Amedeo, we've been working with him since September, and he He's a sixth-generation Italian jeweler with a store in Capri, a store in New York, and so he's been making cameos since, you know, forever. 
selling them in his stores, and he has very um, high-profile clients like Spike Lee, who you know is probably his number one client. Uh, and he decided to go into Web3, but the right way, with uh, you know with ambition, with the right approach to build a community. And so it's all about how you can interpret your physical craft, your vision, your design into a way that makes sense for Web3, that will be well received for, by the community, that's um, you know, beautifully designed, but most importantly, that has a roadmap and that has utilities. How, you know, for us, we always ask the question, what's in, it, when, what's in it for me? Why should I buy that NFT? And then you know, answering this question with digital, physical, experiential applications, that's already a really good start. And then Amedeo shows that it's really about long-term ambitions. You cannot do like one stop and go because it's, it's not going to work. You have to go like full speed into it with you know, heart and courage, I want to see. I want to say, and um, that's when it pays off over time. Building a brand is very, very difficult. It takes a long time. We always say if you want to build a really like elevated, you know, premium luxury brand, it takes five to 10 years. It can be faster in Web3, but you cannot make any mistakes and it has to come from uh, the right place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. It was awesome. Congratulations. Thank you.